Hello, everyone. We are pleased to have you join us for Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Welcome to today's live broadcast, The View from Washington. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labritz, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Cardinal Health. Cardinal Health is a Fortune 22 company that improves the cost effectiveness of healthcare. As the business behind healthcare, Cardinal Health helps pharmacies, hospitals, and ambulatory surgery centers, clinical laboratories, and physician offices focus on patient care while reducing costs, enhancing efficiency, and improving quality. Cardinal Health employs more than 34,000 people worldwide. For more information, please visit www.cardinal.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Michael Beebe. Mr. Beebe is a senior vice president at ADV, where he advises clients on all aspects of reimbursement and strategic policy planning, including specific coding strategies in the physician office and the hospital or other healthcare provider settings. He directs ADV's device and diagnostic practices. Mr. Beebe has a Bachelor of Arts from Penn State University and a master's degree from Boston University. I will now turn it over to Michael Beebe for his presentation. Great, thank you very much, Judy. Appreciate the introduction. I'm gonna to talk to you uh, today about uh, what's going on in Washington, D.C. It's gonna be a little bit, uh, talking a little bit about um, what has uh, passed, the implications of uh, legislation that has recently passed, the Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2014, also known as PAMA, and then also uh, the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, or MACRA, um, that just passed earlier this year, back in April 2015. Um, we'll talk about those that passed, what they potentially mean for physician practices, for reimbursement. And then we'll also talk a little bit about uh, possible uh, legislation that's going to be upcoming, uh, most likely in 16 or 17, the 21st Century Cures Bill that's now going through the House, and then a repeal of the medical device tax, which is something that we're very involved with. Uh, which is also just uh, further behind uh, the Cures Bill, but also going through the House. Then we're going to turn uh, to the regulatory side, look at um, uh, what, what I'm framing or calling old regulation, uh, the different the physician fee schedule, hospital inpatient, hospital outpatient, clinical lab, uh, what's expected from them in the coming months. And then uh, new regulation, which is the implementation of PAMA, that's actually overdue and has been expected for some time now. So that's uh, the outline of what we're going to be talking about today. So first we're going to turn to the Protecting Access to Medicare Act, PAMA. Uh, PAMA was uh, part of the Doc Fix legislation, um, which is no more <laughs> as of the passage of the SGR uh, fix, which is a, a repeal rather, which we're going to talk about uh, next. But uh, the PAMA legislation used the Doc Fix as a uh, legislative vehicle. Um, and it, uh, it, of course, fixed the SGR temporarily um, and uh, provided the shortfall uh, a positive increase for physicians. Um, but also, much to the chagrin of many, it delayed the implementation of ICD-10 until October 2015. That was actually quite unexpected. It kind of slid in there towards the end. Um, and it uh, reallocates the Medicare sequester. Um, for 20, 2024, resulting in sequestration cuts of 4% for the first six months of this year um, and zero for the last six months of the year. So a little bit of relief there. Um, and it also contains several significant uh, policy and changes for the clinical lab fee schedule. So let's talk about those a little bit, what the drivers are for those changes. Um, overall, of course, the drivers for these payment changes in the CLFS, the clinical lab fee schedule, 
are of course uh, increases that are being seen or are expected in the clinical lab fee schedule. There's been a really rapid uptake in molecular diagnostics, genetic testing, uh, where the costs of many of these innovative tests are pretty high. Uh, there's also, of course, substantial investment on the part of labs uh, to, to do the research development uh, on these tests. Uh, there's a lack of payer clarity uh, and understanding of how the tests are performed, the indications for the tests, the pathology and genetic uh, signatures that the tests are looking for. Um, and there's also a lack of standards of evidence. So some of the changes here are not just around payment, but they're also around uh, local coverage determinations by Medicare contractors that get at some of the coverage issues and evident evidentiary issues. And there's also the clinical lab fee schedule itself is quite antiquated. Uh, it hasn't been revised um, since the, you know, substantially since the uh, late 1980s. Um, it's a very old methodology and it's a real challenge for many of these uh, advanced diagnostic laboratory tests. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the specific changes are. Um, there's going to be a new payment methodology in the clinical lab fee schedule. There's going to be a new unique process for developing uh, HCPCS codes and other codes um, for tests on the clinical lab fee schedule. Um, there's a requirement for CMS, HHS to adopt an expert advisory panel. Uh, local MAC coverage authority is changed to be much more explicit around uh, covering local, uh, requiring local coverage determinations and not just uh, memos or uh, de facto changes. And then there's also a requirement for GAO and OIG studies to look at the impact of some of these changes. So first off, uh, PAMA establishes two classes of diagnostic testing. Um, the first class is defined as uh, advanced diagnostic tests. And these are tests that are furnished by a single lab, uh, not sold for use by a lab other than the original lab. Uh, and it requires one of the following, that the test uh, is an analysis of multiple biomarkers, DNA, RNA, or proteins that combine with a unique algorithm to yield a single patient-specific result. Uh, the CPT system calls these MAAAs, or multi-analyte uh, algorithmic analyses. It's quite a mouthful. Um, it's easier to say MAAA. Um, another requirement, uh, an additional requirement rather, is that the test is cleared or approved by the FDA. As many of you know, um, FDA clearance is not required in this space um, currently. Uh, though that might change. Maybe we can do that in another regulatory update. Um, but it's currently not required. So a lot of these tests are currently lab-developed tests or LDTs. Uh, another potential requirement is, is that the test meets other similar criteria established by the secretary. And that's, you know, a big who knows what. And that's why a lot of observers are very anxiously awaiting um, the regula regulations on PAMA. So the non-advanced diagnostic tests are basically all other tests listed on the clinical lab fee schedule. And you notice that this is only in the clinical lab fee schedule. It does not get into laboratory tests such as fluorescent in situ hybridization or immunohistochemistry, which are on the physician fee schedule. So these changes in PAMA policy and, uh, and payment do not get into the physician tests. Uh, the next slide here, so what are the pricing changes specifically uh, that, that PIM is going to implement? For the advanced diagnostic laboratory tests, um, CMS uh, will issue a temporary code. It does not need to be a CPT code. It could be some other type of HCPCS -HIC code, a Q code, or G code. We don't really know how that's going to work yet. And that's why we're uh, anxiously awaiting the, the uh, regs on this, the proposed regs. Uh, but for the first three quarters, uh, the lab will be able to set their own rate. So a lot of people have compared this to pharmaceutical type pricing, where there's not going to be the existing constraints that are on clinical lab uh, fee schedule tests to cross fill or, or uh, cross walk or gap fill. So this, these, uh, they'll be able to set their own price for the first three quarters. And then the fourth quarter, CMS will set the price of the median of the commercial prices that have been submitted. So the lab is expected uh, for those first three quarters to report 
prices that it's received from um, commercial payers to the Medicare program. And then Medicare will base the actual um, fourth quarter price and, and final price on the median, weighted median of all those submitted commercial rates. Pretty big change. Um, there is a grab back for median prices that are lower than the price that was initially set by the lab for the first three quarters. So the lab does need to be accurate and the lab does need to work to, to only sell or only provide services on the commercial side where they can meet that initial uh, you know, rate that they want to achieve. Um, so the, uh, also for these advanced diagnostic uh, tests, the fee will be revised every single year on the clinical lab fee schedule. So no longer will there be static rates, but every single year the fee will be changed based on all the data that's submitted to Medicare by the lab on commercial prices that it's been paid to run uh, to perform the test. So that's a pretty significant change for the clinical lab fee schedule where the rates were very static previously. On the non-advanced uh, diagnostic lab test side, initially the price will be set based on gap fill or crosswalk, which is the current methodology. Uh, labs are, uh, just like on the other side, they are expected to report the commercial payments. But on the non-advanced diagnostic tests, uh, the, the uh, tests will only be repriced every three years, again, based on the median of commercial rates. So it's a little different. So just to make sure we're all clear here, for the existing tests, it's, uh, it's a weighted median done every three years for the clinical lab fee schedule. Um, and again, this, um, this uh, will apply to hospital labs for tests paid separately and not part of a bundle, okay? Um, it's gonna uh, take effect in 2017. So between 17 and 19, they'll collect the rates and the changes that result from those uh, repricings cannot be, uh, cannot be changed by more than 10%. After uh, 2020, the rates can change by as much as 15%. So there is some protection, if you will, for these older um, existing non-advanced diagnostic laboratory tests. Um, on the advanced diagnostic side, uh, the, um, Again, it's the first three quarters, they can set their own price, and they, uh, then they expect to, to set the price set in the fourth quarter um, on the median of all the com reported commercial rates. Moving on here, um, <clears throat> the, one of the major changes with PAMA was a coding reform, if you will, uh, where because of this, the need to submit commercial rates and the, the requirement to have a code for that, for a lot of diagnostic laboratory tests that were either using unlisted codes or were using codes uh, that were multiple tests into one code. There's a need to uniquely identify individual tests, whether it's an FDA cleared test like KRAS, EGFR, or BRAF, um, or if it's a, um, a test like you know, Oncotype DX, which previously was using an unlisted code, there is a need to uniquely identify all these codes now, so, and all these tests. So the PAMA legislation creates a, a unique coding pathway that would allow CMS to, to provide a temporary code under which they could submit all the collected data. Um, so that's a pretty significant change um, that provides a way to get a temporary code. And then the idea is that you will transition into a CPT code, which is considered the permanent code. Um, another aspect of PAMA is that an advisory panel will be established uh, under the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, this panel is supposed to be established by, Jan by July 1st of this year. Um, the authorization for the panel was completed and signed by Secretary Burwell uh, earlier this year, I think in uh, March or April. So its uh, legal framework is in place, but has not yet been appointed. So uh, observers are certainly looking forward to that as well. Um, another one of the changes is that Max will be prohibited from making de facto coverage determinations in the clinical laboratory space. They'll be expected to use the local coverage determination process, which is a more rigorous process. They have to come out with a draft LCD. 
They have to vet the draft LCD by holding public meetings, and then they can uh, finalize the, uh, the LCD. So they can't just issue a memo and uh, cover something or non-cover something de facto. Um, another major uh, change here is that it does leave open the possibility for CMS, HHS, to assign um, specifically designated molecular diagnostic uh, Medicare contractors. As many of you know, uh, the Palmetto program in certain jurisdictions um, operates a program called MOLDEX that is a, a molecular diagnostic contractor and um, covers, pays for, analyzes new tests that come on the market for uh, in the Medicare program. But right now it's only specific to certain uh, Palmetto jurisdictions, which if you look on this map are J11 um, along the uh, mid-Atlantic here, and then JE, which is California and Nevada. Um, JF, which is uh, adjacent to JE, uh, also run by Noridian, um, de facto will take many of uh, the recommendations from Moldex, but does not, uh, is not required to. But the, uh, the panel legislation allows up to four Medicare contractors specific to molecular diagnostics. And uh, it's expected that that's going to be a pretty major change in the molecular diagnostics field. But we don't know yet who those contractors are going to be. It's imagined that Moldex will certainly be one. Uh, but we really don't know yet, and that's also expected as part of the regulations. Um, PAMA also sets up a process by, by which the uh, Government Accountability Office and the Office of the Inspector General are expected to issue reports. Uh, GAO is expected to have their report uh, by October 1st of uh, 2018. This report is expected to analyze many of the changes that, that will have been implemented by 2017. The, uh, all the different payment changes that are based on the commercial payment rates, they're expected to analyze them based on impact, beneficiary access, uh, volume of laboratory tests, uh, new codes that are issued in order to accommodate the reporting, that sort of thing. Um, the OIG is expected also to come out with a report where they would analyze top 25 laboratory expenditures, uh, look at implementations of the effect of the new payment system that was created under the bill, possible problems with reporting um, under, the, uh, under the payment system. So those are two reports that were authorized. The implementation timeline, many, of, many observers think that this implementation timeline has already shifted. Uh, but immediately after enactment, CMS must, must establish the process for temporary HCPCS codes and unique identifiers. They really haven't done that yet. There's been much discussion uh, with the AMA and McKesson um, and CMS about use of different types of codes. Um, McKesson has, been, uh, has developed, uh, in conjunction with Palmetto, a temporary coding system that's used as part of the Palmetto Moldex program. Um, and it's, it's pretty well known that they've been working with CMS to try and get something done there with the McKesson slash Palmetto system, but we don't really know yet. Um, January 15th, they, it kicked in where the Max can only issue LCDs. We've seen that happen with the Moldex program where they're now much more rigorous in how they develop their, uh, their coverage policies and they are, are held to, I think, a little more rigorous standards. Uh, July 15th, CMS is supposed to establish the advisory panel. We'll see if that happens. Um, it's thought to have slipped a little bit. Um, and then uh, January 16th, uh, beginning of next year, the labs must begin reporting private payer rates. And so this is a year of data collection that CMS will go through to look at all the uh, rates that are assigned. Um, and then, of course, all the unique codes need to be in place in order for that reporting to occur. And then January uh, 2017, the market-based payment system and the initial payment period for all the advanced diagnostics will occur. Um, and then uh, October of 18, the GAO report. So that's, uh, that's an overview of the, the, the PAMA legislation with respect to the impact on uh, clinical labs. So it's expected to be pretty significant in terms of payment to labs, uh, unique coding for labs, and then also, of course, the LCD process. Um, let's look now at another uh, law that passed earlier this year, the Medicare Access uh, and CHIP Reauthorization Act, MACRA. 
this uh, act is really uh, notable because of the SGR repeal. And this is a little tongue in cheek here, but uh, the SGR has been around for 18 years, um, pretty much since I've been involved with the Medicare program. And uh, so it's you know, a little bit of a joke here that uh, you know, Washington froze over and pigs were spotted flying over the Capitol and they finally repealed the SGR. Uh, but of course the SGR, as many of you know, is the sustainable growth rate formula uh, established by C uh, CMS then, it was actually uh, HICFA uh, by congressional mandate. Um, 18 years ago, and it's a formula that kind of automatically, the idea was to depoliticize Medicare payment and automatically calculate and update every single year to the uh, Medicare physician fee schedule. Well, due to a, a variety of changes that occurred in Medicare utilization, the past several years have seen negative updates, and then every year Congress had to step in to legislate a positive update, um, or to you know minimize the amount of the negative update in some cases, uh, but uh, of, of note for political observers, every single year that bill became um, a mechanism, a vehicle by which there were potential for new healthcare legislation, as we saw with the PAMA Act. Um, so that's actually going to go away now that the SGR has been repealed, and it'll be interesting to see what new vehicles there are for healthcare legislation now that the, uh, the PAMA legislation is gone, um, or now that the SGR is gone, rather. So let's look at some of what uh, the SGR repeal actually accomplished. So as I mentioned, uh, it's been 18 years um, where the Medicare sustainable growth rate formula um, will now be replaced by a series of new reimbursement models that more closely reflect uh, broader healthcare trends, such as uh, growing consumerism, um, more uh, accountability, pay for performance, pay for quality, and more cost sharing under some of these models. In the near term, the law is going to pre prevent that 21% per percent cut to physicians in the Medicare physician fee schedule. And uh, from now until 2019, physicians will see one half of 1% increase every year. Um, so that's expected to add some stability to the system that was previously had the potential of being quite up and down uh, if Congress didn't step in. Um, this legislative package, as I mentioned, is going to fundamentally change the way physicians are paid. There's going to be two new payment avenues that physicians can choose from that will financially reward or penalize uh, physicians depending on how well they improve and coordinate care. Uh, then beginning in 2026, CMS is going to be forced to establish these different payment rates where it won't be, it really won't be an option for physicians anymore. They'll have to choose one, either the alternative payment model or a merit-based uh, incentive payment system. The alternative payment model is based around ACOs where there's a greater risk sharing on the part of physician practices, and the merit-based incentive payment system is the underlying payment system is still fee for service, but there's much more shift to uh, quality of care and performance measurement. So let's look at some of these uh, changes here. Um, the alternative payment model is reimbursement through alternative care models, such as accountable care organizations. Um, providers will receive a lump sum payment of 5% of their Medicare payments from uh, 2019 to 2024. Um, and then uh, in 2026, Medicare will adopt two payment rates for providers paid through an alternative payment model. The rates will increase 0.75%, uh, and for others, the rates will only increase 0.25%. So clearly there's an incentive here on the part of CMS, HHS, to get uh, healthcare providers into alternative payment models, get them to assume greater risk by incentivizing them with a 5% uh, increase, and then also the 0.75% uh, uh, increase um, over the, the uh, one quarter of a point increase. On the other side, the merit-based incentive payment system side is going to be based on how well per physicians perform on certain quality measures. Uh, it's called the MIPS program, the Medicare Incentive-Based Payment System. It'll be paid based on performance against quality measures that put uh, between 4 and 9% of payments at risk. So let's look at the phase in some of these options. Under the merit-based system on the top part here, um, 
uh, the they're going to so you'll have the 0.5 percent annual update until 2019, and then from 2020 to 2025 that payment rate is frozen, and that's where the CMS HHS really want to see folk, uh, physicians into uh, particip greater participation in the merit-based incentive payment system. Uh, they'll have um, they'll have uh, beginning in 20. 18 years, the last year, of um, some of those separate systems that we currently have today, such as the meaningful use system and the value-based modifier system, as well as the physician quality reporting system. Those are all now separate programs. This um, uh, merit-based incentive payment system will merge all three of them together. Uh, then beginning in 2020, it's going to uh, increase the amount of, that's at risk in those programs, in the new program, where they're going to put uh, a, a deficit of up to minus 5% or a, a, um, a bonus of up to 15% uh, for physicians uh, in this, participating in this system. And then beginning in 2022, the deficit will increase for uh, up to 9% to 27% on the high end. And this bar here is that there are two different programs that they intend to leverage. And they clearly want to try and move people into the higher risk share program, but there's also going to be uh, initially a lower risk share model as well, where not quite as much is put um, at risk to physicians who are participating in the lower risk share. And that they'll also not get quite as much of an increase as well. In the uh, advanced alternative payment model, uh, again, they'll participate in the 5% annual update through 2019. Um, they'll get, in 2019, they'll get that 5% participation bonus. Um, and then uh, what happens here is that uh, beginning in 2019 through 2020, they want the Medicare program wants to see a gradual shift where 20, up to 25% goes at risk. And then 20, uh, 2021 and on, they want to see uh, ramped up Medicare uh, all payer revenue requirements where much uh, more percent is put at risk in the Medicare program. So um, the, the merit-based payment system, as I mentioned before, is within the fee-for-service program, but it's, it's just going to put much more at risk and you'll get much more under just regular fee-for-service. It's going to combine all of the existing programs, the meaningful use, the PQRS, and the value-based modifier. It's going to adjust Medicare payments based on performance um, on a single budget neutrality uh, payment beginning in 2019. It's going to apply to physicians, all non-care, uh, non-physician uh, healthcare professionals. Um, so uh, RN anesthetists, uh, physician assistants, audiologists, physical therapists, etc. Um, it's going to include uh, improvement incentives for quality and resource use categories. And you can see the breakdown here in this pie chart I have over on the right-hand side of the screen, um, where it's, it's, it, there's going to be a distribution, if you will, across different areas. It's all going to be in one program, but there's going to be uh, certain allocations of emphasis, so to speak. Um, on the risk-based models uh, for the advanced payments uh, models here, uh, there's going to be a significant share of provider revenue in the advanced payment model uh, with a two-sided risk and quality measurement, or in some cases, participation in certified uh, patient-centered medical homes. Um, there's going to provide financial incentives, 5% annual bonus, and exemption from the other quality measures that are on the other side of the uh, fee-for-service. This program is going to have its own quality measures. Uh, it's going to include a uh, partial qualifying mechanism that allow providers that fall short um, of the requirements to report quality measures, receive corresponding incentives, or to uh, decline to participate in those quality measures. So it's going to be, uh, the intention is to make this a little bit flexible. And you can see on this uh, table on the right where there's an increase in cost share here. Um, and I got my boxes a, a little discolored. It's um, over on the right, option two, on the, those two boxes, the box on the left, the lower box, lower percentage, is supposed to be the all-payer model. So they do want um, to share some of the risk with other non-Medicare payers here as well. 
So what are the implications here? In the near term, uh, this uh, package is going to provide greater uh, physician payment certainty. Uh, the reliance each year on a doc's fix um, forced many physicians' practices to really think about what they're going to spend their capital money on. And the thinking uh, among members of Congress, and certainly encouraged by the AMA and physician groups, was that the instability of physician payment caused many physicians not to invest in high capital uh, products such as uh, um, electronic medical records and whatnot. So the idea here is that with greater stability, there'll be better opportunity for investment. Uh, so these, uh, uh, some of the quality reporting programs are going to go away. The new law incorporates all of the uh, existing three quality reporting programs into one big quality reporting program. It eliminates the individual bonuses and penalties under the individual ones and it's going to combine them all into one big program. Um, this is going to put much, much more uh, onus back onto the physician. They need to assess their patient population. They need to assess their level of risk and have really good data, really good understanding of the patients that they care for in order to participate in this. Um, so it's going to require acute understanding of the patient demographics. Physicians' practices should determine which reimbursement model is best for them based on their ability to deliver care to a wide swath of the, uh, their practice community. So uh, let's move on from legislation that's been passed to uh, legislation that's potentially pending. And I say potentially because it's really hard to say what's going to go on with this. Um, 21st Century Cures is uh, making its way through the House right now, uh, recently passed out of Energy and Commerce. Um, in, uh, in April of uh, this year, and um, uh, where the whole idea here with the 21st Century Cures legislation is that um, to provide greater industry-wide incentives to innovate, uh, to reduce some of the um, some of the uh, barriers to innovation, and provide incentives uh, to innovate. So. Um, the bill is H.R. 6. It was based on a discussion draft that was introduced in May of 2015, uh, expected to cost $13 billion, and um, it was, as I said, uh, passed out of Energy and Commerce in May of 2015. So let's look at some of the timelines here. Um, it was originally introduced in May of 2014. Um, uh, various white papers were published. Forums were held to discuss it. Uh, the first draft discussion was January 15, second draft discussion April, uh, to, uh, April end of April 2015. Um, and then it, uh, it's on a pretty rapid track here so far, but it passed out of Energy and Commerce in uh, May of 2015. Um, Senate Finance, um, however, has said that they're really not, um, that they're not interested in uh, taking up this legislation this year. So it's going to be put off until 16, at least 16. But what are the objectives of it? It's a, it's a comprehensive look at the steps required to accelerate the pace of innovation in, uh, in the United States. Uh, it's looking at the full arc of healthcare innovation from the discovery in basic science to streamlining drug and device development process, uh, digital medicine, social media at the treatment delivery phase, uh, legislation is designed to speed discovery, development, um, and delivery of new medical treatments to patients by streamlining clinical research, creating more flexible medical device and drug approval pathways for industry. Uh, it's passed through energy and commerce. It included uh, $13 billion in offsets, uh, which is uh, pretty impressive, mostly based on uh, reduction of regulation. Um, and provided uh, 550 million new mandatory funding for the FDA in order to achieve that. Um, and uh, Fred Upman has acknowledged that uh, 21st Century Cures provides both sides of the aisle with a great deal uh, to benefit. And so he sees this as being able to go through. So what are some of the sections to watch in this? The drug discovery section, um, which is sections uh, 1101, 11, uh, 1102, which look at uh, NIH-funded research, 
uh, data clinical trial registry, data bank for, uh, for clinical trials, uh, development sections uh, 20, 21, 22, 21, 81, qualification of drug development tools, accelerated approval of development plan, enhanced uh, combination products uh, to review how CMS reviews combination products like drug eluding stents, um, uh, prior review for breakthrough devices, and then easing regulatory burden with respect to certain classes of devices. Uh, then delivery, um, ensuring interoperability, healthcare information technology, telehealth services, and treatment of certain items or devices. Um, so this, as I mentioned, uh, uh, increases NIH funding. It, uh, this section 1101 directs the director of NIH to not require sharing of data that's inconsistent with uh, applicable laws and policy uh, uh, to um, increase privacy, confidentiality, proprietary interest, business confidentia confidentiality, and information, intellectual property rights, and other relevant rights. Um, Section 1102 standardizes the data in, in a clinical trial data bag. Um, this is, again, the idea here is to streamline data collection to make it more efficient. Uh, in the development section, uh, drug development tools, the, direct, the first section directs the secretary to establish a process for the qualification of drug development tools for a proposed uh, context use as specified by the requester. For the purpose, uh, the term drug means uh, any biomarker, uh, clinical uh, outcome assessment, or any other method, material, or measure that the secretary uses to aid in drug development. Uh, there's an accelerated approval plan in this section that allows FDA to uh, accelerate the approval and development of certain drugs and biomarkers. Uh, there's an enhanced combination product review, um, as I mentioned before, which are products, uh, potentially products that are um, biomarkers where you go through with a combination of biomarker um, and a therapy. <clears throat> uh, then there's easing regulatory burden with certain class one and class three devices. Um, this uh, this uh, delivery section is the interoperability of health information technology, um, where uh, it allows, clarifies that technology must satisfy uh, criteria in order for health IT to be considered interoperable, to secure transfer, complete access to healthcare data, no information blocking, and create categories for interoperability standards. Um, in the health services under the Medicare program, uh, it allows, uh, the CURES allows for a report on populations of Medicare beneficiaries who are dual eligibles, uh, those with chronic conditions, those who may be improved uh, through telehealth services. Right now, the Medicare telehealth program is extremely narrow, and, uh, and this will allow it for greater expansion. Um, treatment of certain devices uh, and uh, items. It focuses on disposable medical technologies by amending the act uh, to include payment for certain disposable medical devices. And this is a new subcategory that's been enabled by um, enhanced electronics miniaturization. It's no longer you know, just a d disposable device or durable medical equipment. There's, um, there's greater interplay there, and this creates a new category of disposable devices that uh, used to be maybe just DME. Uh, another piece of legislation that's uh, certainly being encouraged by the medical device industry is the repair of the medical device tax. Uh, the tax went into, uh, into effect as a result of the Affordable Care Act. It was one of the main uh, offsets in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, went into effect December 31st, 2012, um, and imposed an excise tax on the sale of certain medical devices by the manufacturer or the importer of the devices. Uh, the Ways and Means Committee, uh, sponsored a, uh, um, by Eric Paulson, was introduced to uh, protect Medical Innovation Act in 2015. In early January, um, it would repeal that. Uh, the House Ways and Means Committee, um, uh, actually earlier this week, approved the bill to repeal the tax with some Democratic support. The full chamber is expected to pass the measure later this month. Uh, and lawmakers have not yet said how they would uh, offset um, all the money lost in the medical device tax. Um, 
the uh, let's look a little bit at some of the regulatory rules now that are both um, expected and then some that um, have been pending now for quite a while. So in the Medicare program, you uh, every single year you expect to have a physician rule, you expect to have a hospital uh, inpatient rule, a hospital outpatient and ASC rule, and then also the clinical lab fee schedule uh, rulemaking process. On the physician side, the proposed rule every year is expected uh, in early July, usually just in time for the July 4th weekend. Um, this year, uh, the proposed rule for the first time um, will include new and revised CPT codes that are due to go into effect January 1st of next year. Usually those new, co new codes only appear in the final rule. This time, CMS has uh, asked the, uh, the AMA and the specialty societies to accelerate their code de development and valuation process. So for the first time, many are going to appear in the proposed rule. Um, and then the final rule will be published in November for implementation in uh, January 1st. On the hospital uh, outpatient side, the proposed rule comes out at the same time as the physician fee schedule. And um, that's expected again July 4th weekend and uh, to take effect uh, uh, with the final rule in November. Um, some of the big changes that are expected there is that uh, CMS is expected to in some way continue its packaging initiative that it began two years ago where they created the comprehensive APCs, eliminated uh, add-on codes, eliminated the ability to build some, a lot of the different adjacent services and uh, became much more of a prospective payment system. Uh, on the inpatient side, uh, the proposed rule was published in uh, April. Uh, we expect the final rule to be published in uh, October. And uh, on the inpatient side, they also have a new packaging initiative based on um, some new episodes of, of care. The clinical lab fee schedule, um, CMS announced last week that it intends to hold a public meeting July 16th, 2015, where they will look to gap fill or crosswalk for all new codes. But the big one we're really waiting for is, um, is the uh, PIMA implementation. And as I mentioned early on in the presentation, payment implementation has been expected, was originally expected first quarter of this year. It's been delayed. But this uh, implementation regulation is expected to provide guidance on reporting for commercial payments, which is key. Um, the definition of uh, the advanced diagnostic laboratory tests, whether or not they're going to include uh, FDA cleared um, drug or, uh, diagnostic tests in that definition and uh, what, you know, possibly companion diagnostic tests. So um, the uh, development of temporary codes, are the temporary codes going to be maintained by the AMA? Are the temporary codes going to be maintained by McKesson or Palmetto, as, uh, as uh, they have requested to do? And then the advisory panel on coverage and payment, who's, uh, what's going to be the makeup of that panel? Who's going to uh, participate? Uh, how much influence are they going to have, et cetera? So all that is expected out of the PAM implementation. And that finally is it. Um, that uh, concludes the uh, overview of uh, recent and expected legislation and regulation. So I'll leave it open to questions. Thank you for that informative presentation. I am thrilled to be a part of Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Following this presentation, head over to the community of learning in the Lab Exchange lobby to have the opportunity to engage in live chat and have more of your questions answered on the spot about the view from Washington. Give people a moment to ask questions and um, you know, it, it appears there are no questions from the audience at this time. So um, I just want to remind everyone to head over to the Lab Exchange lobby 
so you can engage in live chat and have your questions answered directly by Michael Beebe. Um, I would like to thank our sponsor, Cardinal Health, for making today's educational webcast possible. Uh, again, make sure to head over to the Community of Learning um, to um, right now to speak with Michael Beebe and he'll answer your quest questions directly. Uh, today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through October of this year. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. And we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.